everyone. My name is Sandra Kuchin. I'm Assistant Director for Education and User Support at the University Computing Center in Zagreb, Croatia, and Eden Vice President for Open Professional Collaboration. Thank you for joining us today here in Zagreb at Srce Premises and online globally. Today, the Open Education Week has started, and Srce and Eden are proud to be part of this global initiative that is going for the fifth year now. Open Education Week is a celebration of the global open education movement, whose goal is to raise awareness about free and open educational opportunities that exist for everyone, everywhere, and right now. Also, I wish to add that this year is the year of the open, a global focus on open processes, systems, and tools created through collaborative approaches that enhance our education, business, organizations, and governments. This year, we mark significant milestone for open education. 15 years ago, the term open educational resources was created, and the first Creative Commons licenses were released. 10 years ago, the Cape Town Open Education De Declaration was written, and five years ago, the fi first Open Educational Week took place, and the first OER World Congress was held, resulting in uh, Paris OER Declaration. And today and uh, this year, we are going to have the second OER Congress, which is going to be in Ljubljana uh, in autumn. Looking back, today we can be happy that lots have been achieved so far, but still, there is a long way forward in shaping the open future. So today, we have invited just the right person to be with us and talk about open and openness. With us today is Cable Green, Director for Open Education at Creative Commons. Cable works with the global open education community to leverage open licensing, open content, and open policies to significantly improve access to quality, affordable education, and re re uh, research re resources so everyone in the world can attain their educational goals. He is leading advocate for open licensing policies that ensure publicly funded education materials are freely and openly available. Cable's presentation today is titled Open Education, the Moral Business and Policy Case for OER, and will provide an overview of open licensing and the OER, and discuss specific examples where institutions, governments, and foundations have moved the default on funding practice and culture from close to open. After the presentation, please join me in discussion online via chat box in webinar, and here at Srce, just raise your hand. So Cable, thank you for joining us today and getting up, getting up very early in the morning. We appreciate that very much, and please, floor is yours. Great, thank you. And could you just confirm you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great, thank you. Very good, and uh, I just wanted to confirm the time. Would you like me to speak for about 30 minutes and then take questions, is that about the right timing? Yeah, yeah, that is, it. That is okay. Okay, well, uh, good morning everybody from where I am. I know it's not morning your time. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak and happy Open Education Week. Uh, it's an exciting week. There's events all around the world, 24 hours a day in, uh, in languages all over the planet. So this is a, a focused week uh, where if you uh, are doing something related to open education, uh, please tell people about it. And the way that most of us do that is through social media or our websites. And for those of you in, uh, in the webinar, in the chat window, I dropped in the link with a hashtag for Open Education Week which is Open Education and then WK, so Open Education Week. And that way everybody can see the good work that you're doing. Uh, my information here is on the screen. If anybody wants to talk more, my email is there and, uh, and I'm at C Green on Twitter. <clears throat> all of these slides are of course openly licensed. Uh, so you may all have a copy of them for free. If you don't understand what open licensing is, you certainly will by the end of the half hour. Uh, so first, um, I wanted to acknowledge the, the really great work that Europe has done um, long before open education even started. Um, Europe has the grand history of open universities that much of the world has adopted. And uh, open universities, as you know, uh, primarily 
um, are about uh, open access to affordable, high quality, effective learning opportunities for students. Um, and this is a, a major equity play that Europe has made uh, over the past uh, decades, long before open education started. Uh, and it's also those open universities which tend to lead in the efforts around OER and open access. And some, uh, some specifics, um, Europe has been a long time leader in open educational resources, um, has really been a leader in what we call open praxis or open education practices or open pedagogy. Um, certainly in, in research, there's a major uh, unit called the OER Hub uh, at the Open University in the United Kingdom. Uh, open licensing policies, um, there have been open access funders like the Wellcome Trust and the European Union itself, uh, which have required open licensing on resources that they fund. Um, certainly open access uh, policies to, uh, to make sure that the publicly funded research is available to the public that paid for it. Um, and the list goes on and on. Metadata standards, copyright reform efforts. I just received an email this morning from the Netherlands um, and they're working with the European Union to try to expand fair use and fair dealing rights for everyone that uses educational resources to try to make copyright more flexible than it is today. So the world looks toward you for leadership and we, we follow your lead in all of these areas. So before we get started about the details of open educational resources, it's worth pointing out what has changed. Um, the long list of things um, good things that have happened in terms of declarations and new licensing structures, et cetera, were listed in the introduction. Um, and a lot has happened in the last 15 years. Um, this has also happened. So everything that we use in education today um, has a digital back end. So certainly we use print, we still use other types of media, but there are digital files on, uh, of everything we use, the videos, the textbooks, the curriculum, et cetera. The reason that's interesting is that digital things cost uh, almost nothing to store, copy, and distribute. Um, it's still very expensive to build an educational resource, and it's expensive to maintain an educational resource. But once those costs are taken care of, the additional costs of sharing with your department or sharing with the rest of Croatia or sharing with the entire European Union or sharing with the world, those additional costs have fallen to near zero. And the reason for that is we have the internet, we can move data around the world at, at near speeds of light for very low cost. Um, and uh, the falling cost, costs of computers and disk space and server farms. And so it's very, very inexpensive to make copies of things. And of course, <clears throat> with the internet, we have the ability to move these digital things around very quickly. So we can make copies, we can move them around quickly, and we can do so for the marginal cost of zero. So what's the problem? Well, the challenge is that we have something called copyright. And copyright's not a bad thing. Copyright just uh, is, is law in, in all of our countries that says when somebody creates something, uh, that that thing that they create is protected uh, and nobody may make copies of it, they can't perform it, they can't modify it, um, they can't distribute it to others without permission of the copyright holder. And again, that's okay for the copyright holder if, if their intention is to keep that and not share it. Those are good protections to have. But what about all these people around the world, all these educators, scientists, musicians, uh, museums, who do hold the copyright to their materials but they also want to share. It's in their mission to share. So I would say I, I was a college professor for quite some time. And I would say that as a, as a teacher, um, as somebody who was, my job was to spread knowledge that education is primarily about sharing. It's about sharing knowledge with my students. It's about sharing ideas and knowledge with my colleagues around the world. So what the internet enables, this, this free, easy copying and distribution Copyright forbids. So we'll get to licensing in a minute. First, let's talk about open educational resources. So educational resources are it's all, the, all the things that we use in our classrooms, in our online classrooms, our face-to-face -face classrooms. It's the, the videos, the assessment banks, the textbooks, everything that we use. 
open educational resources, we mean something very specific. Uh, first, the, the students or the, the people who are using the content, uh, they can get access to it for free. And by free, I really mean no cost. So as I said before, there is a high cost to build quality educational resources and to maintain them. But once those costs are taken care of, to share it with another million people costs near zero. So we can give access for free. So that's the first condition of an OER. The second condition is that you've got the copyright permissions to modify the resource to meet your needs. We call those the five R activities. I'll get to those in just a moment. So it has to be free and you have to be able to download it in Zagreb. You have to be able to um, translate it from Spanish um, into local dialects. You have to be able to change the order of it, uh, throw out what you don't want, write in new pieces that you do. So you have to have those legal rights for it to be an OER. So open is not the same as free. Most of what's on the internet is free, and it's also all rights reserved copyright where you don't have the legal rights to make modifications. So free is assumed online, but we say open is different than free, and open is better than free. Open is free plus permissions. So it's free plus the legal permissions to do these 5R activities. So I need to give uh, credit at this point, give attribution to uh, a guy named David Wiley, who's been in open educational resources for uh, longer than we've called it open educational resources. And this is his way of thinking about the legal permissions that you get with an open educational resources. So the first one is retain. So retain is I get to keep a copy. My students get to keep a copy. Um, I don't have to take it away from them. And I know that sounds really simple, but in fact, the new model in higher education for many publishers is that you don't get to retain a copy. They uh, lease, not sell, but they lease access to your students with a code. And at the end of the semester or the quarter, your students lose access to the educational resources that they paid to access. So that's a new model that we're seeing. And in that case, there's no retention. With, with OER, you get to retain it forever. There's no reason to take a copy away from people. It was free to give. We give them the digital file. We give them a printed copy. Um, you might as well keep it. So retain is the first one. Uh, reuse uh, is I'm going to take... Um, that that course from the University of Zagreb and I'm going to download it just as it is. It has an open license on it and I'm going to use it without making any modifications. Revise is I'm going to take that course and change it somehow. I'm going to revise the course to meet the needs of my students. Remix is I'm going to take that course and I'm going to download a course from MIT OpenCourseWare because MIT's all of their courses are openly licensed and freely available. Uh, I'm going to download uh, or use some of my materials and maybe that Wikipedia article. And I'm going to remix something together uh, and create a new work in the same way that I would remix, uh, uh, remix music. And then redistribute. I'm going to take that, that changed, modified, updated piece of educational material that I've created and I'm going to share it with the world. I'm going to redistribute it. So these are the five R's. Retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. For something to be OER, you have to be able to do all of those things with the resource legally. So retain is fundamental, fundamental, because if you don't have a copy of the thing, if you can't retain it, then you simply can't revise or remix it. So as I said before, watch out for these new artificial scarcity models. We don't live in a world of information scarcity anymore. We live in a world of information and knowledge abundance. If we choose to use the tools like the internet and things being digital and open licensing to share. So if you think about what you use at your institution, it's a real mix of things. And frankly, it probably always will be. And, and that's okay. Um, you're probably going to have some commercial resources that your students either buy or you uh, lease access to. You probably have uh, library resources at all of your colleges and universities um, where the library licenses uh, databases or journals 
uh, from commercial entities and then provide free access to faculty and students. And that's a good thing too. And then you'll probably have some open educational resources. And the point I wanna make here is that uh, if you look at the two columns, there's a cost to students uh, for each one of these uh, types of materials. And there's also a set of permissions, legal permissions, 5R permissions that come with these resources. And so the first row uh, are both expensive and they're all rights reserved copyright. And so it's expensive and you don't have the rights to change it. Library resources, of course, if they're licensed, if they're paid for by your university, then they're freely available to faculty and students. Um, the university is paying for it and the students are paying indirectly through tuition and other fees. Um, but it is, there's no additional cost if you want to assign those to your class, but they come with restrictive rights. So these t also tend to be all rights reserved copyright. So if I'm faculty and I don't See quite us. like the way something's arranged, I can give you part of it, but I can't really go in and, and change that resource. I probably don't have the legal rights to do so. Of course, with OER, you get rights to do uh, both those things and it's freely available. So I'm going to shift just a little bit and talk specifically about the cost of textbooks for just a moment. And these are um, numbers from the United States. But when we look around the world where there are countries that do charge higher education or tertiary education students for textbooks, we see similar numbers. And so very quickly, when textbooks are expensive, roughly two thirds of students don't buy the required textbook because it's too expensive. Um, and that's a problem, of course, because faculty go to uh, great lengths to design their courses in a way that are going to help their students learn. And when the students don't have access to the resources that the faculty have designed for them to be successful, they're not as successful. Uh, the next stat here is that half of students say that the cost of the educational materials that they're required to buy as part of a class are impacting both how many and which classes they took. So there's two ideas here. How many is, I was going to take three classes this semester, but because of the high cost of textbooks and other materials, I can only afford to take two. And so that's extending my time to degree. Um, it's, it's gonna be longer before I'm out in the workforce doing what I want to do. And the which classes they took is also uh, a bit sad. Um, this stat comes from students saying, you know, I really wanted to be an engineer or I really wanted to be a nurse. And it, the educational resources in those classes are simply too expensive. And so I'm going to have to choose a different career path than I might have otherwise thought. Um, so students are actually making choices about what they do based on the cost of the educational resources in many cases. Um, and then no surprise, students say, if I had all the resources that I needed to be successful, I would do better in the class. Um, the students understand this. If they, have, if they have what's designed for them to be successful in the class, they, they know that they'll be more successful. Okay, so I talked about two parts of uh, why we have OER. The first one being uh, contents digital, and we can share it at the marginal cost of zero. Of course, we still print a lot, but the sharing uh, happens digitally. Uh, we talked about uh, the internet and how we can move it around at near speeds of light. Here's the third piece. And this is where I work, uh, which is Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we provide the open copyright licenses that the world uses to share. Uh, and not just for education, but for science, for academic uh, publishing, for museums, for music, movies, uh, everything from documentary films to really any type of copyrighted content uh, can be openly licensed. We have teams all around the world, uh, including all across Europe. These are volunteers who teach people um, just like we're having a conversation today. So the reason that Creative Commons um, exists and uh, is that we had two extremes before Creative Commons. On the left, you can see we have public domain. And public domain is wonderful. When works go into the public domain, anybody may use them at no cost. You don't need permission. And uh, you may use it for whatever you want, including educational purposes. On the far right, we have all rights reserved copyright. Again, nothing wrong with copyright. But if I have copyright on my work and I want to share it with you, 
before Creative Commons, I yeah, I had to say, well, let me see if I can get a lawyer to write a license so that you can use my work. And I don't know about you, but I don't have my own personal lawyer. Um, I, I'm not independently wealthy. And so uh, that was difficult. And I, I didn't have those resources. Creative Commons came in and said, look, what we need are open copyright licenses. We need to let the copyright holder keep their copyright, keep their ownership over the work and give a license, not just to one person, but give a license to the public, to the whole world, to use the copyrighted work under the terms and conditions that the owner says are okay. So it's the, it's the copyright holder keeping their copyright and saying, here are the rights that I give everybody around the world under the following conditions. So these are the conditions that you can choose. The first one is attribution. That's not a choice. Uh, these are required on all of the Creative Commons licenses. And what this means is somebody uses your work, they have to give you credit. They have to say who the author was, what the title of the work is, uh, what the source is, where the, what the URL is, uh, where it is on the internet, and what license it's licensed under. So in, in the academy, in higher education, we understand that when we use somebody else's work, we give them credit. It's the right thing to do. The other three are optional. Share alike is if you take my work and you change it somehow, you must relicense your new derivative work, your new modified work under the same terms as mine. So that's that's Wikipedia. Everything on Wikipedia is under an attribution share alike license. Non-commercial is you can take my work and use it, but you can't commercialize it. You can't use it primarily for commercial purposes. Basically, you can't put it on the web and sell access to it. No derivatives is you can use my work for free and you can distribute it, but you may not modify it. You can't change it. When you mix these different uh, license conditions together, you get one of six different Creative Commons licenses, and you've probably seen these uh, around the web. And when we think about education, we think about the licenses like this. And if you look up at the top of the list, um, the top one's actually not a license. It's called a public domain dedication. So for in my country, for something to go into the public domain, uh, first I have to die, and then 70 years have to go by after I'm dead, and then you can use my work in the public domain. Um, so that's, um, if I don't wanna wait, if I don't wanna die first and wait 70 years, I can use CC0, it's called, Creative Commons Zero, and I can dedicate my work to the public domain today. Most educators don't do that. Most educators keep their copyright and they add a license to give others access. And that's what these other six are. These are the licenses. Where the green arrow is that says OER, those are the licenses which give people 5R, 5R permissions. So we talked about the legal permissions that you have to have. The reason that the bottom two don't is they are no derivatives. So ND is the no derivatives license. And of course, if something is no derivatives and you can't change it, then you can't revise it or you can't remix it with some other content. And we would say it's that's freely available and that's nice of you to share, but it's not open because we can't change it to meet our local needs. And in education, we try to stay as close to the top of this list as we can because the further, our, further we are up this list, the easier it is for other people to both understand the license because it's it's less complicated and, and it more important we can remix uh, more content when something has for example just a creative commons attribution license on it so we like to say that we put the open in oer and when you find open educational resources around the world they're either in the public domain or they have a creative commons license on it uh, over the past 15 years there have been some some different open licenses. There was a free art license for art artistic works, and there were a few uh, different licenses like that. Uh, in the end, um, people kind of gave up on those and said, look, let's just use one common set of licenses. Um, all of these licenses are free to use. Creative Commons doesn't charge for any of this. And we've also dedicated all of these licenses to the public domain. So if Creative Commons as an organization went away tomorrow, uh, they would all still be there. And so this has really become the standard for sharing uh, copyrighted works on the web. And you can see over time, the use continues to increase. And in fact, the slope, the, the, uh, the rate of use is increasing rapidly. These numbers go up to 2015. Uh, 
we were at about 1.2 billion known licensed works on the web, uh, and we'll be around 1.3, 1.4 billion uh, when we report on 2016 in about a month. So how is, so we are changing higher education? Well, uh, there's a lot happening. Um, one area is in textbooks. So if you haven't seen this project, you should take a look at it. It's called OpenStax. Um, these are books where, as I said before, are very expensive to create. They spend um, a little less than 1 million US dollars uh, creating each one of these books, and they spend upwards of 100,000 US keeping them up to date every year. Uh, but then they give them away for free. Now, these are all funded with foundation money, um, and the universities also contribute. Uh, but the idea is that these are textbooks in highest enrolled courses, and not just highest enrolled courses at Rice University, where they're built, um, but highest enrolled courses all around the world. Everybody teaches intro to statistics. Everybody teaches intro to economics and macroeconomics and microeconomics. Everyone teaches anatomy and physiology in their uh, programs for doctors and nurses and dentists and optometrists all around the world. And so uh, these resources are both free and they're under a Creative Commons attribution license. You can download them and do whatever you want to do with them. Uh, there are new networks. Um, there's a, a great network in British Columbia that's similar to this. this these numbers come from the state of Minnesota. Um, there are also um, amazing networks across Europe um, that are uh, leaders of open education that are working together. Um, this one in particular, just to uh, show the, the, the rapid increased use from 2012 up to 2017, um, this is something called the Open Textbook Network. And if, if you want to see a, a location where you can see a lot of the most popular textbooks that are highly rated by faculty who use them. Um, you can go just type in Minnesota Open Textbook Library and you'll find that. And again, not just the open textbooks, but also reviews about them. <clears throat> Another thing that we're seeing are uh, entire degree programs going open. So these are a few numbers. Um, it's a movement sweeping North America right now. The idea being that we're not just not just going to move one course to OER or one textbook to OER, we're gonna move an entire degree program. Uh, and there's been a lot of effort <coughs> around that. But I would say all that is infrastructure. Uh, Creative Commons licensing, necessary, but kind of boring. <laughs> uh, the internet, we know how that works. Um, things being digital, that's not going to change. Um, we've, we simply, all of our educational resources are digital. The cost savings that come with OER and the increased access, it's really exciting because now 100% of your students can have access to 100% of the materials on day one. But these are all things that we should just be doing, right? This is infrastructure. It's like having good roads in your country. If you don't have good roads, it's very difficult for your economy to function because people can't move around. Um, and I would say that everything I've said so far is really the infrastructure for the exciting work that we want to do and need to do in education. So uh, increased efficiencies are the least exciting thing about OER. The really exciting work, and this is uh, this quotes from a woman named Catherine Cronin, uh, who's in the United Kingdom, is open education practices. <clears throat> and again, the, this is a space where the Europeans have really led and the idea here is that there are things that we can do in our teaching and learning when the content is open and when we think about our teaching and learning practices more openly and allowing students to engage in new ways that we couldn't do when our practices and our content was closed. And so Catherine says, open educational practices are collaborative practices which include the creation, use, and reuse of OER. So OER is certainly part of it. You've got to have this open content. But it's not just that. It's the pedagogical practices employing participatory technology, so technology where people can actually contribute, modify things, uh, jump in, and, and help. Employing participatory uh, technologies and practices. Peer learning, so students are starting to teach each other and teach the faculty knowledge creation and sharing. So when, when you're dealing with OER, students can actually update chapter two in the chemistry textbook as an assignment. And that's a very exciting thing if you're a student. Now I, my, you've asked me to write, you've asked me to write well, 
and uh, and you're telling me that what I write is going to be shared publicly with the world. And so I'm going to spend a lot more time on it and do a great job. And it's fundamentally about empowerment of learners. So learners are not just passive recipients of knowledge or working in a group and then giving an assignment to the faculty that then gets thrown away at the end of the semester. Um, they're actually contributing. Um, there's a question I see, are OEP and open pedagogy the same? Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting debate about that. Um, but I think where I come down on it and where many do is that uh, open pedagogy is part of open educational practices. Open educational practices is a bit larger. And I, I like the way that Catherine has framed it here. So uh, let's zero on an open pedagogy. It was a good, good segue with that question. Um, with open pedagogy, so, so I should say that my doctorate is in education psychology. So I study how people learn. And there's two things about learning that we've known for decades. Um, and if you boil down my field, <laughs> it kind of boils down to this. One is you need to give people authentic tasks when they're learning. So if you give them something that, they're, uh, that they can actually do, and that, that thing that they're doing matters, I'm not giving you a senseless task. I'm actually giving you something where you can do something that's going to make your life better or your families or your communities or your country better, or maybe even the world. Maybe I'm working on climate change. Um, and the second thing is that I let you engage in co-construction of knowledge. So I'm, I'm, you are actually helping to build the knowledge that we're learning together. If you do those two things together, students' motivation goes up at its highest levels and people learn the best. So the exciting thing about open educational practices broadly and open pedagogy more narrowly is that what we have on the screen here, people learn when they do things, when they have their hands on things, when you ask them to do something authentic. Um, copyright restricts what we're allowed to do. If we're giving students all rights reserved copyrighted materials, you simply can't give assignments to update chapter two because they can't, it's illegal to do so. And even if they write a new chapter two, the odds are odds of the publisher taking it are extremely low. Whereas with OER, you can just do it. You have the rights to do it. So open permits us to do these new things. And so as faculty, we're starting to think about, well, what do we do with this? How can we change our classes? Uh, what different activities can we do? What does open allow me to do in my class? So these are a couple of slides from David here. And he says, you know, look, mostly what we do today are disposable assignments. We hand out assignments to students. They do the assignment, they turn them in. At the end of the semester, the faculty throw away the assignments and the students throw away the assignments. And that's uh, highly demotivating. Right? If you're a student, you say, yeah, I learned and that was good. And now I move on to my next class. But what I did in this class didn't actually change anything. It didn't matter. It mattered to my learning, but I didn't improve the course. I didn't change the world in any way. And so when we shift to open educational practices, to open pedagogy, we can use renewable assignments. We can actually give students assignments to uh, be citizen scientists and collect data in the field as they're learning biology and take those water samples, do the analysis, learn biology, yes, but also contribute that data to the university researchers that are working on uh, environmental protection, for example. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the time here. I'm going to move very quickly through the last few slides, and then we'll move to, uh, to questions and answers. So what are some of the ways that OER can benefit your college or your university? Well, we've talked about this one at length. Um, it improves access. Everybody gets access. Nobody goes without resources because we can give them for free to everybody. Uh, we save a lot of money. So we save students a lot of money. We also save, uh, we save faculty a lot of time. When faculty shift to sharing their resources and using other people's resources, um, it's kind of like moving your course to an online course. When you move it the first time, it takes a lot more time to redesign your class and move your class online. But once you've done it a couple of times, some efficiencies start to kick in. And the same thing happens with, uh, with OER. When we start to share, uh, we don't have to recreate the wheel. I don't have to build everything new. I can start to take from my colleagues around the world. Um, this is a resource you can look at later. It's a, it's a textbook savings calculator. You can see how much your students spend on books now, and if you move to OER, what the savings would look like. Another huge advantage of OER is that because of the open license, you can fix errors. You can fix bugs right away, and you can keep content up to date. So if you think about uh, political science, for example, 
Uh, imagine using in your classroom a political science book that was written two or three years ago. Um, and you know maybe the Crimean Peninsula is still part of the Ukraine. Um, and maybe there's a different president in my country, which would be nice. Um, maybe there, you know, things are different and they, they're simply out of date because of the publication date. But though we are, it can be up to date. Um, I talk with a lot of faculty who tell me this. They say, you know, look, as I'm a professional. Um, I've gone to school to be a teacher, to be a faculty member. And when I use all rights reserved copyrighted materials, I am restricted in what I can do. When I use open materials, I can change them and modify them to make them exactly the way I want them for my classroom, for my students. And I want to be able to do that without breaking the law. And so a lot of faculty um, don't move because it saves students money or it increases access. They'll move because they want to do with the content what they want to do with the content. And don't tell me I can't do it because I know what works best for my class. And that's absolutely right. When you're working with, with OER, you can do that. So some things that colleges can do to support OER. So if you're making asks of your administration, uh, here are some things you can ask for. Uh, raising awareness. So having events like this, Open Education Week is all about teaching people about open education. Um, colleges oftentimes provide support. Uh, they'll give release time or maybe some extra stipend money for faculty, or maybe they provide a librarian who can help faculty find OER or student interns that help uh, discover and weave OER into a course. Uh, talk with, um, in your case, not states, but I would talk with your national government, with your Ministry of Education about getting uh, some grant funding for moving courses to open. Um, and to the extent that you have uh, reviews or promotion and tenure committees <clears throat> at your colleges and universities, um, sharing either academic research or educational resources, both OA and OER, those should be recognized as positive, innovative activities. So if I share my textbook openly or my course or I publish my research in open access journals, those should all be given positive uh, comments and positive points and not negative. So let me stop there. I'll uh, turn the mic back over and happy to answer any questions. Very interesting presentation. And I'm opening the floor for discussion now. Uh, so I, as I said, you can write in the chat the questions or ask uh, the here in the in the Srce. Um Are we having some questions here? Maybe, um, maybe what would be the first steps when uh, someone like a teacher or, or researcher uh, would like to start uh, doing OER or even better trying to, to do OEP, or Open Educational Practices? What would be your recommendations, how to start, where to start from? Sure. So um, people usually start in one of two places. Um, either they start to use other people's OER, which is always a good place to start, or they start to share some of their own. And d different faculty take of different first steps. For me, I started using other people's OER. So, um, so when I was teaching, I started to, to find other people's content, um, which is something that faculty already do all, all the time. Uh, we go to conferences, we talk with our colleagues, we ask them what resources they use in their class and, and if they're working well or not. So the idea of, of taking good resources, best practices, content <clears throat> from somebody else uh, who we trust and using it uh, is already in the academy. So that's, that's fairly easy and that's a great thing to do. Um, so then what kind of follows with that question is where do you find this? Um, and there are many places uh, on the web to find uh, OER. There's uh, OER Commons, there's Merlot. Um, some countries have their own OER repositories. So India, for example, has its own repository. Slovenia has a big repository. The United Kingdom has a big repository. So sometimes it's country-based. Um, but you can also uh, go broad and you can go to Google Advanced Search and search for what you're looking for and then filter by Creative Commons license. Um, if you're looking for college uh, or university courses, go to the Open Education Consortium and click on courses and uh, they're the hosts of Open Education Week and, and you can search for courses. 
Um, and then as far as open education practices, my, the first step there is to uh, talk with others who are doing this already and have a, have a presenter uh, come to your university who's already engaged in uh, not only OER, but they've actually started to change their, their teaching and learning practices to involve students in updating and improving content or involve students in collecting data in new ways and providing that uh, to solve real world problems. Or uh, in, in the most radical form, uh, there are courses like, uh, there's one called DS106. So if you type in DS106, you'll find this, where the syllabus is even co-created with the students at the beginning of the class. Uh, it's a class on media studies. And then the students together write the assignments that each other take. So there's some, some fairly radical versions of this as well. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, what we were trying to achieve, have a student active participant uh, in, 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 in uh, education. Um, you have two questions here from Jack Comey. Hi, Jack. It was nice to have you in Zagreb three years ago. But, uh, well, you, can you see the questions, uh, uh, Cable? Can you answer the questions? I can, and I'll, I'll read them for the people in the room there. <coughs> Jake, uh, Jack says, uh, at a recent conference, Someone told me that the free MOOC I have just authored is not open because people have to register and get an account. The CC license that he used, so he put a Creative Commons license on it, was by NCND. So, so Jack, it's a great question. Um, and let me rephrase it. Could, can you take, could I share my content as OER? And is it still OER if I put it in my learning management system at the University of Zagreb where only the faculty and students have access? I put it behind that, that secure space. Um, most people say, yes, that's still OER. And one thing that, um, that people do often is, and Jack, in your case, it's, it was even less restrictive than that. Any, it was completely open access to anybody, but they just had to uh, register and get an account. So I would say, you know, that's fine because really what you're doing is you're tracking, uh, you're tracking use and you're also providing additional services because they have an account. Um, I would say, Jack, where I would say that your content was not OER was you used a no derivatives license. And as I said earlier, um, it's broadly um, thought around the world uh, in open education that the two no derivatives licenses from Creative Commons even though they are still Creative Commons licenses, they're not OER compliant. And the reason is, Jack, that if I if I really liked your content and I went and I downloaded it, which I can legally do under the license you've chosen, uh, but I can't modify it. So I can't revise and I can't remix it. And so we would say that's it's free content. It's uh, it's maybe very high quality content, uh, but it's not op it's not open education resources because of that ND license. So that's something to think about, Jack, is you might want to remove that ND license so that other educators can, can use it. Uh, and then I see another question here and it says, what do you say about less used languages and contextualizing OER? So excellent question. There's actually a, a really great project in Europe called uh, Lang OER, L-A-N-G-O-E-R, and it stands for languages, different languages, and uh, less used languages around OER is the whole purpose. It's an EU funded project. And one of the benefits, of course, of openly licensed content is that, yes, thank you, Lang OER. One of the benefits of openly licensed content is you don't have to ask permission to either share your copyrighted resources that might be in a lesser used language or take OER that's in Spanish or French or Russian or Hindi or English or whatever language that might be more broadly spoken and translating it into the lesser spoken language. And so there are, there are amazing translation projects all around the world where it's not just translating it from one language to another, but as you point out, contextualizing the OER to meet local needs. So for example, uh, I just left uh, Cape Town. Uh, there was a big annual OER conference in Cape Town two weeks ago. And I was talking with astronomy professors uh, at the University of, of Cape Town. And they said to me, most of the 
textbooks that we use to teach astronomy are from the global north. That's where they're published. And so the, the sky charts, the, the way that the stars are oriented on, in the textbook are all upside down because we're down here in Cape Town and that's not how the sky looks to us. And so we actually need the, we need these charts flipped over. And they, what they used to do is have their students turn the books upside down, which was not helpful, right? We should just, just change the educational resource. And so you're absolutely right. Um, and thank you for providing the link there for everybody else. Okay, and you have one more question in technical support. You like uh, more borderlines uh, between uh, OER, OEP, and open pedagogy. Just summarize shortly. Sure. So uh, OER is the content. So uh, it's all the stuff, the videos, textbooks, test banks, all that's OER. Um, that's the, the educational content that we use. Um, of course, uh, there's technology, and some technology is closed and proprietary, and some is open. So uh, we also use uh, open source software in many cases, but you don't have to use open source software to use OER, although, although many people do. Um, another technical thing which we did not talk about is when you're sharing your work or derivative works that you've created, it's really helpful to share in an open technical format. So I could share my textbook that I wrote with you <clears throat> under a Creative Commons attribution license. So you have all the legal rights you need to do whatever you want, but if I share it in a locked down PDF file, it's very difficult for you to edit it. It's much more helpful, I and mean, it's fine if I share it as a PDF, but I should also share it as a Word document and as an open office document and maybe as a text file, right? I share it in other formats that, that you can edit and, and modify and make, make your own. And then OEP, if you go back, uh, the slides will be shared out later, but I won't go back, but OEP are, is not just, it's the use of OER, and it's all the open practices that we use to think about teaching and learning in more open ways where students become co-creators of knowledge. And then open pedagogy is specifically on the pedagogy employed in, in the class. It's the, it's the, the actual teaching and learning theory, uh, which is what, what pedagogy is about. It's the theory of teaching and learning. It's specifically how we think about how people learn and how we set up uh, assignments, uh, activities, et cetera, for them to learn in that, in that space. Okay, thank you very much. Um... There's a, a lot of questions I would say uh, will be going on, but maybe just to summarize in, in the end, uh, open education or openness is here to stay. And I think that it's important that we try to find the ways how to employ uh, the openness uh, in every way. And maybe in some countries to uh, enhance the policies and the uh, government to be able uh, to be aware of, of, uh, of it because uh, like in Croatia, we are still uh, facing uh, the time when our government we will, will recognize the, the benefits of uh, the openness. Um, so uh, thank you again for, for being with us today, for getting up early. We are getting into the end of the day here. Um, although the weather was nice here, I don't know, is it cold uh, in, in your uh, state? It's, it's cold and raining. Oh, <laughs> well, today is, it's not so uh, hot here, but we had about 18 to 20 degrees the last few days. So, well, like we are getting into the summer. So, uh, well, I'm very happy that we had you for the beginning of the Open Education Week, uh, which is the fifth, we, fifth year in a row. And um, thank you for participation and being with us today. Thank you. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. And I hope to see many of you in Slovenia in September for the OER Global Conference. Yeah. I'll be there and uh, I look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, I'll be there too. So see you there. And maybe in the meantime, we will cooperate in different fields as well. Thank you. Bye. Uh,